And yet, I wonder sometimes... Please don't do like, that with your arms, KP. Please I'll never don't do that, that with your arms. I, it, Corey, Corey, it was instant regret. My sincere apologies to you <laughs> okay. and Sam for witnessing At that. At least he's a And everybody else king. across YouTube. Oh, my God. As soon as I started doing it, I went, don't do this, Kev. Stop. 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 What Stop. are you thinking? It's not you. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome to After the Bell. I am still Corey Graves. Unbelievably fast lane is already in the rearview mirror. Crown Jewel is looming. It has been a jam-packed week here in WWE. And to follow suit, we here at ATB have attempted and perhaps failed to jam-pack this episode of After the Bell. You may have been spoiled Tuesday night on NXT by John Cena. Paul Heyman, Cody Rhodes, Asuka, L.A. Knight. Oh, The Undertaker. <laughs> we are giving it the old college try. Joining me as he does each and every week, the fighting Irishman, Kevin Patrick. But as a very special treat to ride the coattails of the biggest and greatest NXT in history. He is the host of the Not Sam Wrestling Podcast. He is a member of our WWE broadcast family. He is none other then Sam Roberts. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. I am excited. I'm pumped, man. Thank you guys for having me. I do. I feel I feel very privileged to be a part of the WWE broadcast family, but I also feel like like an like a cousin. You know what I mean? Like not, <laughs> right, we, not we part wait of the... until the, the reunion to give you a call. It's not like right. a typical football Sunday invite, but you know, once in a blue right. moon, we've got to remind you we still love you, Sammy. Right, exactly. And I appreciate that. And that's probably how I'm best taken anyway, honestly. <laughs> I, love, I love the way Sam, by the way, is holding the microphone today. I mean, it, it, we had to do a, a quick clap for the audio purposes beforehand. And Sam is like trying to hold the microphone with his elbows and trying like to get the seal, clap going. Like a circus yeah, seal. It yeah, was very, very right. impressive. Very that's impressive. Right. Guys, we got so studio. much to talk about. This is one of the rare weeks where Kevin Patrick and I sat down this morning in our little pre-production What's the word I'm looking for? Soiree, not a soiree. Uh, <laughs> go there. Ooh, ha, ha, a, there you go. Some sort of meeting uh, where we just chin wag. We had a little chin wag. A little chin wag. I like that. And uh, there was far too much to narrow down as to what exactly the hell we are going to discuss today. No shortage of content and topics. The industry is red hot right now. Sam, you have a unique ability that you uh, you keep your finger on the pulse of the entire wrestling business in a way uh that we don't often get here on wwe it's always wwe centric but uh i'm excited to get a, an outsider perspective on uh all things that went down in the last week within the wwe universe let's start at the top guys saturday night indianapolis indiana fast lane what were some of your biggest takeaways kp i know you were lounging you were watching every moment hanging off the edge of your couch what were your biggest takeaways from Saturday night? For me, I'm still thinking about poor old Seth Rollins and, and, and the beating in that last man standing match, but then surviving. What he put his back through in the end and getting over the line. And then I, I've, I've still been asking the question, was Damian Priest right to, to heed the advice of Rhea Ripley and, and hold off a little bit? You know, even you and I in, in the chat beforehand, Gravy, were saying, was this the right decision from Damo? Big Damo had an opportunity when Seth was beaten to a pulp, but survived. Was that not his opportunity, Sam? Yeah, I was I was surprised by it, especially like the minute that the Judgment Day lost the tag team championship. It's very rare that Judgment Day allows a night not to be theirs, right? Like when they start on the losing end of things, they figure out how by the end to still be winners. Right. There have been multiple occasions where they've come up short from a results standpoint, yet right. usually just lay waste to everybody anyway. I mean, even look at what happened in NXT, right? Like. Dirty, dirty, dirty Dom goes to no mercy, loses the title. It takes him two days to get back on NXT and win the title back because they don't stay down. Because that's how the streets I, taught him. That is exactly how they taught him. I mean, how do you think he survived in the pen? It's the only way I've heard. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I don't have the experience that Dom does. But, yeah, I was uh, I was su surprised that, that Priest didn't take advantage of what was, I mean, seemingly a pretty clear opportunity and that he listened to the Judgment Day at all, right? It's like, ultimately, he's a part of a group, but the group didn't win the briefcase. He won the briefcase. He didn't listen they, to the Judgment Day, Sam. He listened to Rhea Ripley. There's a big difference. Yeah, it's true. Mommy. Mommy, it's hard. It's hard to say no to mommy. 
Listen, and, and I understand that this, it seemed as though the opportunity was at hand, that Priest had, had a green light to go to cash in, but I think it was the right decision. I think if you are not 100% and perhaps then some, even with an injured Seth Rollins, why waste that opportunity? You have a winning lottery ticket in your hand that you can cash in whenever you decide. I think it was a smart move for Priest not to cash in, but in, in the end of that matchup, or I'm sorry, I'm going to jump back to the, the tag team title matchup, which in and of itself was shocking. My biggest takeaway, ironically, wasn't that Cody and Jay are the new undisputed tag team champions. It is what in the blue hell is Jimmy Uso going to do Friday night at SmackDown when the Tribal Chief comes back? What is Solo going to do knowing that he failed the bloodline and Roman's coming home Friday night in Tulsa on the season premiere of SmackDown. This does not bode well. And I'm a bloodline guy, Sammy. Yeah. I, I bleed bloodline. I believe in them. I have supported them. I am a fan of everything about the entire faction, the family, the history. This does not look good. No. And I'm, I mean, I'm with you. I'm a bloodline guy through and through. Uh, I, I mean, the, the, the physical, change in Paul Heyman I love sometimes like I'd been watching Paul Heyman over the last few weeks and I've been kind of noticing that you know sometimes he's doing appearances and he ha he doesn't have that clean shave and I'm like oh what's up with what's up with Paul and then I started to notice that he was letting the hair go a little bit like he wasn't maintaining the dye job like he was before I was like what's 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 going on with Paul I hope he's okay and then it was actually the genius of Michael Cole that mentioned to you on commentary, Paul Heyman looks like he's aged 20 years since Roman Reigns left. And I went, oh my God, that's it. The effects of Roman not being on television and the bloodline not being the strongest force on television have been written all over Heyman's face. And I think it's not just about that tag match. It's about, it's about both tag matches because not only did the bloodline lose, but the guy who left the bloodline won. Right. Jay walked out with gold, and Jimmy and Solo, they lost. Yeah, it, it certainly does not seem to bode well. And I, and I have more questions because the way that SmackDown went off the air Friday night was this apparent alliance between the Judgment Day and the bloodline. How does that factor in? Uh, do, do and I and, and and I wonder too, but I mean, there are all these little things going on, right? All these stories are now starting to intertwine amongst each other, and there is this strange alliance between the bloodline and the Judgment Day. But at the same time, there was that that real subtle moment where where Paul reached up and he grabbed Solo's wrist and he pulled him down. He said, "No, no, 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 no. leave Jimmy up there, but no, you you come down. You you not you yet. You you stay down with us." And it's like. What is Jimmy's standing in the bloodline? Why was Solo pulled away? Like what, what, what is what is happening just beneath the surface of what we're seeing? Also, is that alliance that we're seeing simply a lack of trust from Roman Reigns that the current bloodline that right, is there right. on Friday nights can get it done? Are the oh. castle walls being stormed, and it's just a matter of Roman feeling paranoia and saying, "Listen, I know that the bloodline seems to be fractured right now. I need someone to." To cover my ass i need yeah. a few roadblocks in the way uh, from anyone gunning for the tribal chief it's very interesting to see how all that'll play out what were some of your other big takeaways from fast lane fellas i mean I, you know it, it's interesting because like i love those moments when it just clicks like oh that's when things changed like right there that's when things changed and i feel like when cody and jay won the tag championship it was like oh that's pretty cool most people didn't see it coming it was like oh, okay this is really this isn't a one-time sort of tag up thing this is a real team now the the press conference though oh my god i thought yeah <laughs> that was that was the moment it was like you're watching these two and this is where you start to see jay right jay has this jay has this cool factor right where he, he just influences like everybody around Jay not only wants to be around Jay, but it's just whatever energy Jay is on. They're trying to match that. Like, okay, this is, this is where we're going. He's the pace car for fun. And, and Cody was right alongside watching Cody, this, this kind of 
modern day Cody, this this buttoned up, suit wearing, professional, hair perfectly placed Cody, keeping up with Jay, who's literally growling into the microphone. And it we're was, witnessing this charm of this pairing. It's like, I, I didn't know before Fastlane, but coming out of Fastlane, I just want to see these two together. I completely agree with you. And it weirdly enough added almost another dimension to your point to Cody, because we see Cody and Cody is always so motivated, so fired up. And yes, he's always grinning ear to ear, but we saw Cody in the press conference having fun, letting his hair down, so to speak. Yeet. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go, y'all. We got to go, man. I'm riding with Cody Rose. Go. And, and if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. It's all over social media. But my takeaway from that moment where it was a little bit, uh, you know, uncharacteristic of a WWE press conference, but it gave me the vibe of what you see all over Sports Center and all over the news outlets the day or the week after the Super Bowl where you actually see yeah. Tom Brady guzzling a bottle of champagne. You know why? Because he's the world champion. They're <laughs> celebrating. It's not a problem. It is a, 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 a celebration of an accomplishment. They just became the undisputed tag team champions. Of course, you're going to go out and have a few beverages to celebrate. I mean, let, let, let's be honest. It was great. I, I agree. I think it did a lot for both Jay and Cody. Uh, and charm is a great word, Sam. The charm that they both showed unintentionally. Uh, I think it was really exciting, and it was evidenced by Monday night on Raw and Tuesday when Cody was in the ring and the crowd is chanting yeet yeah, at Cody dude, Rose. I, <laughs> How quickly I mean, that caught fire. And, and it's so, like, you know, yeet has been thrown around in my house for about a month now because, you know, my six-year-old is on YouTube all the time, and he's talking about yeeting stuff constantly. And so when I turn on, and not only has, has yeet become part of, Jey Uso and Cody Rhodes vocabulary, but it is an essential word right now within the realm of sports entertainment. I'm going to let you know a little secret, Sam. Yeet is nothing new. If you have spent right. any time around Jimmy or Jay in the last, I don't know, three years. <laughs> what up, Oos? Yeet. Yeah. What yeah. up, you? That's exactly Yeet. it. Hey, hey, how was your day? <laughs> Yeet. It's, it's, it's almost like just the international word that you just assume whatever you want it to mean, and it works. I love it. I think it's fantastic, and it was a lot of fun listening to the NXT crowd chant. But fellas, who had this, who had this coming? I mean, nobody. You go back not a me. few months, right? Not me at all. Jay not Uso. as hot as the Judgment I, Day is. And, and, and the thing is, right now, though, Jay's music, he comes out solo. There's that fresh vibe about it. The, the, the WWE universe are all over it. I'm in my the commentary desk just loving what Jey Uso is doing and yet I wonder sometimes please don't do like, that with your arms KP please I'll never do that, do that with your I, arms Corey Corey it was instant regret my sincere apologies to you <laughs> okay. and Sam for witnessing At that least he's and a everybody else king. across YouTube oh my god as soon as I started doing it I went don't do this Kev. stop stop, stop. what stop. are you thinking it's not you anyway I just wonder with the way Jay is right now and the wave that he's riding two things is it not a mistake to side with Cody but is there a sense of what is going on with my family right now? And am I better off having a partner like a Cody Rhodes who's got connections, who's got the relationships elsewhere, as we've clearly seen over recent weeks, and having that backing on Monday Night Raw? Because who knows what the hell Roman Reigns is going to do and how things could royally kick off once he returns. And it's no harm for Jay to have that backing, right? But that's the kind of the state of the union in WWE right yeah. now. Everybody needs someone to watch their backs. I mean, you've got the bloodline. You've got the Judgment Day. You've got Bobby and the Prophets. Uh, you've got Cody almost out of necessity joining forces with Jay. We've seen them sort of link up and look after Kevin and Sammy in the past. You need someone to watch your back because otherwise the disciples of apocalypse and Los Bariquas are going to come out of the woodwork and just wreak <laughs> havoc on everybody. Now it is of the utmost importance to have someone watching your back. And this is why it's so important to watch the product all the time because history repeats itself and we learn from it. We've witnessed gang warfare before and it's come back like tenfold in this era. Uh, I, I mean, I respect this thing with Jay because it's 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 committal right like even when when jimmy turned on roman before SummerSlam, there was still this like no he's still our family no we'd still forgive him like he's and you don't exactly know where that guy stands right now i think the fact that jay is on raw and has now created this team with cody rhodes tells you 
He is declaring himself fully, not one foot in, one foot out, not, oh, I'm just going to see where everything lines up. He goes, I am not associated with the bloodline. This is my time. I'm, I'm main event Jey Uso. I'm hanging with, with one of the tribal chief's most rivaled foes. You got to respect the fact that he's not leaving any question as to where his loyalties lie. I'm not going to argue with you, Sam, but listening to you say that, allow me, old CG, to muddy the waters a little bit. Let me throw a stone in the puddle, so to speak. If I'm Roman Reigns and I'm looking at the landscape, and to your point, there's been all this turmoil within the bloodline and we're not really sure where we're going, and Jay emphatically stated that he is out. If I'm Roman, maybe I want jay as my right hand man again maybe i learn from the past maybe i bet on the wrong horse maybe i was so wrapped up in the fact that these guys are family yes jay did betray him but jay suffered the consequences jay's been cast out what if roman says you know what i need a new leader of my army and i only trust one guy i need someone to wrangle solo and jimmy's proven he can't do it and jimmy's the one that screwed up SummerSlam for jay who knows? Jay's right? life's pretty good right now, Corey. Jay's I mean, feeling pretty good about I'm life right now. I'm not saying Jay would accept. I'm just saying, yeah. objectively speaking, if you're Roman, and to the conversation we had a few moments ago where things are heating up, you need somebody standing in between you and, and your future opponents. I want Jay back. I don't know. I, 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 I'm not saying it could happen. It may be a fantasy. It may be completely nonsensical. But if you are the tribal chief, you are the head of the table, and the bloodline does run as deep as we know it does, and I'm not saying on screen. I'm saying in reality, which is why the bloodline works so well and has worked over the past few years because it is all rooted in reality. If I'm Roman, I'm saying, all right, dude, what do you need? I want you back in the family. I need my sergeant back. I need my right-hand man back. And, and I mean, think about the psychological journey that Jay Uso has been on. Like, he's happy right now, but we've all been in relationships where we get out of that relationship that everybody told us we shouldn't be in anyway. And we find a new girlfriend, and it's great, and she's supportive, and we're having fun. But then all of a sudden, the ex pops back into your life, and you you can't. You can't help it. You know you shouldn't, but you throw everything away because there is something, there is some kind of mental thing, there is some kind of connective tissue that forces you to go back to the way things were before, even though you shouldn't. And I think that goes back to what you were just saying, Graves, about the fact that this is real. This is blood. This is, this is I mean, the, the mental torture that Jey Uso went through with Roman Reigns. You can't just break that. You can't just leave your cap door and and go, okay, out of my system. I am on to the next thing. That stays. That stays within you. And Roman Reigns is a magician of the human brain. I wouldn't be surprised if he knows exactly what those mental weak spots are for Jey Uso. And maybe this is what Paul Heyman was referring to when he said... What inning are we in? Bottom of the third. Mm. Yeah. Everybody's so quick to write off the end of the bloodline, but here three idiots staring at each other through a computer screen just came up with a very plausible possibility for the future. Unlikely perhaps, but plausible, which makes this such a compelling story and one of the most compelling stories in the history of our business. And of all people for Jey Uso to team up with and become a champion with Cody Rhodes, Roman's opponent, from WrestleMania, oh, just a few months ago, right? The fella that wants to take down Roman Reigns. Like, could also, you have picked anyone else? K KP, you, you spark, sparked a little more interest in, in a little, little history, and I know Sam will appreciate this. Of all people who should be wary of who they align themselves and trust, the son of the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, who oh. was betrayed on a practically weekly basis by oh. horsemen, by this guy, by that. No matter who, Dusty was constantly getting stabbed in the back. You think maybe Cody would have taken a little note, and maybe he has. Maybe Cody is being extremely cautious. But, it, it, and I know it was it was a Sting issue, not a Dusty Rhodes issue, but when Sting was an honorary horseman and then they lulled him in and said, hey, you're one of us. Just kidding. We're going to take you out. <laughs> that could be, uh, look, I, it w I wouldn't put it past Roman. I wouldn't put it mm -hmm. past Paul mm -hmm. Heyman. Mm -hmm. Dude, look at the sweet sapphire. Sweet sapphire. 
Dusty gave her everything. He breathed life into that woman, and all it took was a couple bucks. I know. For her to leave him high and dry. Those roads, they have these great big hearts, and they welcome in, and they trust, and these things happen. And, I mean, look, you know, I I think it's worth talking about what's going on with Cody right now because, you know, let's be honest. From the perspective of the WWE universe, which is where I am fortunate enough to sit, there was a question of what's next for Cody. When you go – and Michael Cole, uncomfortable as it was, brought it up on Raw. Like, when you go from WrestleMania – and they can't finish the story. But then you bounce back of that, you go through Brock Lesnar, right? And it's like after Roman, after Brock Lesnar, I think fans were asking, well, what's next for Cody? Where Where is left to go? And the question got answered at Fastlane. Like, all of a sudden, this partnership with Jey Uso has breathed life into Cody Rhodes. I think Cody needed this for himself as well. Either way, like there's no way this doesn't get complicated because either Roman's got to deal with the fact that Jey Uso is partnering with the guy who is expressly after Roman's title or Cody could be betrayed. Like there's no simple answer. So is it a masterful play on behalf of Cody? Is this months and months in the making premeditated from Cody Rhodes where he's saying, look, if I can get one person on my side from within the bloodline, it's Jey Uso. If there's one fella that knows the inner workings of the mind of Roman Reigns, it's Jey Uso. That's okay. So pretty hot take there, Irishman. I love it. (laughs) Right. Because let me tell you, let me tell you something. You, I mean, Corey, Corey, you know, dusty Rhodes better than a lot of people, but I mean, Cody grew up with him. This is a, this is a family of people who know this business inside and out better than anybody. Can you imagine if Cody saw this coming a mile away, if Cody said, Jay is going to need support? Jay, I mean, this is a very, very, very malignant way to look at Cody Rhodes. It, it is, say, but, it's, but it's perhaps malignant, simultaneously, potentially brilliant. Yep. Yes. Yes, it's look not at, nice. No, it's but, not nice, but it's very, it's, it's when KP spells it out like that, if we still don't know exactly why Cody brought Jey Uso onto Raw, right? That's true. And I'm still waiting to find out who we get on SmackDown as a result. Yes. Yeah. Still oh, waiting to see how that this, all shakes out. Look if at this KP. is all strategy. KP Ooh. dropping pebbles in puddles, man. Stirring well, well, it if all up. If, well, if you're Cody Rhodes, right? If you're Cody Rhodes and you look at the constant numbers game that's played by the bloodline and you're taken out in front of your family, your wife's family, everyone in attendance on the grandest stage of them all, then you, you look at the, the whole finishing the story thing and say, well, it hasn't happened for me, but how do I get there? What do I need to do? Yeah. Change your approach, Oof. man. Lay back. Oof. Let the other waves of attack come at the castle. And meanwhile, Cody could be sitting and plotting and planning, and he might wow. actually be a few steps ahead. Wow. wow. KP, bravo, man. That was that was. Can I do the Jey Uso dance? No? No. No, you cannot. Okay. You're going to ruin it. Don't step on your own moment. You know what that tells me? The fact that KP even thought of this means that his niceness is a farce. Anybody totally questionable. Were, <laughs> I, mean, I no longer t- trust no you any further than I can throw you, <laughs> KP. Well played, Sam. <laughs> Keep an eye out for daggers in my back. Oh, seriously. <laughs> I'm going to have to take the, the Drew McIntyre school of thought and attempt to do things all on my own, to navigate the waters, the madness of Monday Night Raw alone without someone watching my back, which appears to be where Drew McIntyre is existing right now. And we saw a few glimpses of what the future may hold. Obviously, Raw kicking off with Drew McIntyre challenging Seth freaking Rollins for the World Heavyweight Championship. It's made official. It's going down at Crown Jewel. And then moments later, there was a lot of speculation. Why did Drew do this but not that? Why didn't Drew run to, to Seth's rescue when he was being beaten down? Because Drew wanted to save the money in the bank contract. To me... What we saw from Drew McIntyre flies in the face of sports entertainment logic. (laughs) It's what a man you could possibly expect to do after having been through all the things McIntyre has. McIntyre is now the sum of all of his parts, all of his experiences. He's been at odds with the bloodline. Drew understandably has trust issues up and down the roster, but to see the logic in Drew's brain when he went, I don't care about Seth Rollins, the man. But Seth has what I want. Seth has 
the World Heavyweight Championship. And I probably won't get it unless I protect that until the time comes at Crown Jewel. Very, very interesting turn of events. Drew McIntyre now finds himself potentially in the crossfire of the Judgment Day. And also knowing that this title match is looming, what can we expect in the lead up to Saudi Arabia? Well, I think it's also strategic in the sense that he knows Seth Rollins has a hurt back. Like like Shinsuke Nakamura made that everybody's information that Seth Rollins has a bad back and it's now been made worse multiple times over. So I think that's also one of the reasons that he's protecting him. He wants that Seth Rollins. Well, protecting him Crown to Jewel. an extent because th right. don't forget to to, piggy to piggyback off of your point. Seth isn't 100%. Seth does have a bad back. And McIntyre was in no rush to come to his aid. No. No. When, it was, when it came to the physicality, to the beatdown, that was smart. Drew's going, all right, I got my target, and these guys are starting to work for me. I'm not going to let them finish the job. But it's smart right, but to let, let that all happen, let it all play out. Let them do step one and step two so I can do step three. Correct. Is, 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 and, and I've been waiting for this side of Drew McIntyre for a really long time. Like, it seems like Drew McIntyre three years ago was the guy. Like, he was in the position that Seth is in right now. That was his time. And I don't think that he ever got to see that fulfilled the way it should have been fulfilled. I think since then, he's been a team player in a lot of respects. And to an extent, he's gotten walked on. Yep. He yeah. hasn't been in that conversation because he's reliable. He's a team player. He'll be there when we need him, and it'll be all good. He's not selfish. But now he's well, looking Drew out for is, number one. Right, and Drew has realized it's time to get selfish and remind everybody, oh, I'm the guy that can destroy the entire roster. You guys forgot. I've been being mm -hmm. nice. I'm mm -hmm. not going to be nice anymore, and I love that. Good. I, I don't like nice Drew McIntyre. No, I love I, Drew no, McIntyre. you've said this before. But I want the big, terrifying Scottish psychopath, the guy who's yeah. six foot five of muscles and anger. I, I want that Drew McIntyre. And let me tell you, it's almost unfair that we, as the WWE Universe, forget or at least fail to acknowledge the fact that Drew McIntyre kept this company afloat as champion during the toughest period in history. Mm -hmm. During the pandemic, during the Thunderdome era, and and Drew never really got his flowers and never mm -hmm. got the opportunity to enjoy living life properly as the top guy, as the face of the company. And you know that fuels him. And, and, and I mean, and that doesn't make him a bad guy. That makes him reasonable. This is a guy who worked his ass off, captured his dream, but nobody sort of really acknowledges it. And, and think about when he was somewhat derailed. Clash the Castle. Right, mm -hmm. things all kind of go mm -hmm. south after that, and and he he's been a bit par player. You know, there's been some injuries here and there as well. But Drew McIntyre is Drew McIntyre here. There, there are not many guys that have the athleticism combined with the sheer force that Drew McIntyre has and the charisma that that he can bring with it as well. I can't wait for this one, guys. And, and the, the the subplot, of course, Sam, as you mentioned, of Seth Rollins being in a bad way now, just a few weeks till. Uh, so we head to Saudi Arabia. This is going to be a big, big moment, and Drew could get right back on track here as world heavyweight right. champion. I've interviewed Drew many times, but every time I, I've spoken to him since we got out of the pandemic era, every since he's lost the title, he's told me straight up he feels like he's owed a WrestleMania moment. Mm -hmm. But that his WrestleMania moment was not his WrestleMania moment. He won in the main event, but it wasn't the right way, and he has owed that moment back. And I think he's realized that – They've the decision's been made. No one's gonna give it to him. And so he's if he wants it, he's gotta take it. And that's what he's doing. Speaking of big moments, what did Saturday at Fast Lane do for LA Knight for you, Corey? Ooh, I think LA Knight solidified himself, and that's what it was all about. That was the opportunity that LA Knight was fighting for. He hasn't had beef with the bloodline, but LA Knight is the hottest star in the business. They acknowledged him as such on Tuesday night on NXT when he was the special guest referee. Listen, the guy may not have the, the resume that a lot of top stars in the WWE have, but this is kind of a throwback in a sense to let's ride the hot hand, man. If it's not broke, let's not fix it. Let's see if there is a limit to what LA Knight is capable of. Uh, you want to say the sky? He's broken through that. He's crushed multiple glass ceilings at this point, and his ascent continues. 
which is interesting. And it seems like many people are sort of sitting on the sidelines watching this going, all right, nope, here comes the ride's coming to an end here. Nope, he's going to hit this wall. Nope, and he somehow veers out of the way and just keeps on going. You're out there with John Cena. You pick up a victory over the bloodline. And look, Cena has been very open and honest. He's not going to be here for a long time. He's back here currently, and we're all grateful for that. But John's going to go away. Someone's got to pick up the slack. Someone's got to keep the torch moving. I think six months ago, a lot of people would have said, L.A. Knight, are you crazy? Are you kidding me? That guy? But look, Kevin, you and I have been in the arenas week after week after week all around the world. I remember the last time we were in Saudi Arabia. There was a press conference. L.A. Knight wasn't even in the country. Mm -hmm. And they were (laughs) chanting his name. Look, maybe not everybody believes, but clearly enough people believe right now that L.A. Knight is the star that they want. You, We as a company, we as a business owe it to ourselves to ride a hot hand. Maybe he burns out in a spectacular fashion and it isn't the guy that we thought. He isn't the prince who was promised. But along the way, man, it's a hell of a ride. So two things on that. One, you said on Friday Night Smackdown that LA Knight doesn't seem out of place at all. He doesn't seem phased by being alongside John Cena. There's something about LA Knight right now that's so unbelievably comfortable within his own skin. And I go and back that's to that, what makes that the promo. Difference. Exactly. But it's the, tw- it's the 20 years or so of conditioning himself. And, and that promo with The Miz, where he talked about being that thoroughbred on the outside, just waiting for that lane to open, to grab his opportunity. It, it really rang, th- rang true for an awful lot of us, I guess, because he has been that guy. He's been waiting for that opportunity to come in. And man, has he grabbed those valuable minutes, as you often talk about here on this show, Corey, and he's run with them. And the, the important thing to realize is it's the confidence that sets LA Knight apart. I'm a guy who spent 15 years on the independence before I got to WWE. I, and I'm not unique in that sense. You look at your Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, Seth Rollins, a who's who that populates this business, all cut our teeth on the independence, or at least most of us did. And I remember there being a, a fear factor when I walked in the doors of FCW. I was of the mindset, all right, nothing I've done here before here matters. And that I was starting from scratch. And much like we talked about uh, with Santos Escobar, where he was able to go, okay, nothing that I've done before matters. This is a clean slate. It's a fresh start. Santos was able to maintain his confidence. He understands how to play the game, how to navigate the waters, how to earn those opportunities. I was a guy, and, and I don't know that everybody feels this way, but I can speak personally. I was scared to death when I walked into WWE thinking, Okay, yeah, I've been in a couple thousand seat arena in England. I've done death matches in Japan, but this is WWE. This is this is the holy grail. And walking in there, I approached it very much at first with the mindset, I don't know. You guys tell me what you want me to be, and I will be that. I will give you what I, you know, what you want. I was trying to please everybody else and almost forgot who I was that got signed, that earned the contract. L.A. Knight did not. L.A. Knight knew the whole time. He got fired and went, okay, I'm still going to do what I'm going to do. And he kept doing it and kept doing it. And he got another opportunity. And he said, hey, if it doesn't work this time, you can fire me again. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing it. And he believed in himself to such a level. And the fans see that. The fans feel that. You cannot fake that sort of confidence, that sort of swagger. And that is why, in my opinion, L.A. is still red hot and not just this guy that's got a little buzz about him on the Internet. Yeah, I also think that Fastlane was one of those key moments for him because I feel like in in watching the rise of LA Knight, historically in WWE, there have been so many times when fans decide this is going to be our guy. And then they're, as you're watching the show, you feel a resistance. Like you feel a resistance going, well, not really. No, he's not going to get that opportunity. No, he's not going to quite get that. Like you're going to cheer him, but uh, I don't think so. Things are different now. And, and I feel like opportunities are handled differently in the sense that with the rise of L.A. Knight, because he's the latest guy who is, I believe, fan created in the sense that we chose him. The Correct. fans chose him by making noise for him and leaving no other option. I also feel like since SummerSlam or so, everything he's done has been a test. Like everything feels like if this doesn't work, we can cut bait whenever we want. If this doesn't work, we can send him back to square one. And every single time he goes out there, you feel that. As a, as a fan, you're watching him going, 
every single time is his moment. And every single time he's capitalized on it to the point where the ultimate test was going into fast lane and standing in a ring next to John Cena. And the fans were chanting, L.A. Knight, L.A. Knight, L.A. Knight. My, my favorite moment of that, and I think this is why L.A. Knight is so smart, is that, and, 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 and Graves, you can speak to this much more than I can, but this is the way I interpreted it as somebody that's, you know, watched WWE for decades at this point. When John Cena went to raise L.A. Knight's hand, and L.A. Knight said no, and he raised John Cena's hand, he played it off in the press conference like, I wanted to do that to show my appreciation for John. I don't think that's the case. I think he will, I think he appreciated John. I think he wanted to show respect for John. I think he also wanted to make sure that the world knew that John was in L.A. Knight's ring and that the, the kudos were L.A. Knight's to give, not John's to give. Um. And in that moment, it was like, okay, this is not John Cena going, hey, this kid, he's all right. He'll be something someday. It was L.A. Knight going, Hey, I'm the man right now, but how good is John Cena still, huh? And it completely shifted perspective from, oh, yeah, John Cena thinks L.A. Knight will be a star one day to L.A. Knight, the star right now, is giving John Cena. And, and correct me if I'm mistaken, but you're not sowing seeds of dissent here. You're, you're saying no, that no, L.A.'s no, 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 confidence no. Yeah. is such that I'm the dude right now. I am the right. guy that's going to be here in a month or two months or whenever John's run uh, ends for now. I, I never looked at it like that, but that's a really, really, because I took the, the same thing that I think most fans did. Uh, hey, you know what? I'm LA Knight and this was awesome, but guys, this is John Cena. But but I, I see what you're saying. Almost like, I hate to I hate to use insider terms like this, but like a reverse rub. So I, I, I have a slightly different perspective and it comes from having him on After the Bell here where he talked about, you know, going for, he, he mentioned yeah. going for brunch with his, with, his, with his partner and friends and they were like, wow, you've really made it. And he's like, stop. Stop. It's like he can't let that infiltrate his mind. This business of that. you've made it, like he's always got to be hunting. And, and to allow John Cena to give him that moment would be a, a really significant moment in the career of LA Knight. So maybe he just didn't want that because he constantly wants to be the guy that's hunting that ta-da moment, which, you know, none of us ever truly experienced. But it's that moment that, that he, if he feels that if he allows John Cena to do that, you know, does that take away from future endeavors? I, I'm not so sure. Time will certainly tell, but there was no rest for the weary. L.A. Knight with a moment of his career Saturday night at Fastlane. And then we'd see him again on Tuesday <laughs> on the greatest, biggest, hugest, most spectacular, wow. over-the-moon extra edition of NXT in history. L.A. Knight was a special guest referee. John Cena was in the house in the corner of <laughs> Carmelo Hayes. Paul Heyman in the corner of Braun Breaker. The Undertaker showed up. <laughs> Th this, to me, was a, a love letter. Uh, one of those very rare standalone nights for WWE that was sort of an appreciation for the fans, for everything that NXT has becoming, for business being as red hot as it is. And again, there's a lot of business factors that, that get into this, and I'm not going to dive too deep into all that, but there are legitimate financial business reasons as to why NXT was so stacked Tuesday night, much like there are legitimate business reasons why Becky Lynch has been around, why Seth Rollins was there semi-recently, why the main roster talent is sort of being integrated, and it's not what you internet fans think it is. It's not a big, oh, we're at war. It's not that. It's numbers. It's the television business. But, man, you talk about over-delivering. Sam, I want to ask you. I know you've been an NXT guy since basically the genesis of it. What were some of your biggest memories and takeaways from Tuesday night? I mean, just first of all, the observation and to, and to, and to go off of what you said in terms of the business decisions that are being made, ultimately, we're at a spot right now, which is so great, because NXT as a full product – has has never been so keyed in to making sure there are as many eyes on the show every single week as humanly possible for various business reasons, like you just said. But what that means is that WWE and NXT are fighting for our eyeballs. And as a fan, it's the absolute best case scenario. You want people fighting for your eyeballs because you end up with shows 
like we got on Tuesday. The fact that like we got so much Christmas on this show <laughs> that I think some people forgot. Oh yeah. The undertaker is supposed to be coming out here at yeah. some point too. I mean, I said this, okay. There's two things I love in professional wrestling, fun and physicality. All right. The undertaker comes to the ring on the bike after Braun Breaker has been talking about being a badass all night, which, which once that all clicked in, I was like, this is the reason that Paul Heyman put so much stank on that badass introduction. Do, do the reason it I kept knew, being said. Do you know how I knew that Braun Breaker was a badass? How? Written on his gear. Just in case. <laughs> just to remove any doubt that he was not just dog. Which no. Which on the front. Yeah. Badass. Big red letters. Badass. Just in case. And then he says, I, and then we see, I'm the bad, I'm the number one badass. The Kid Rock music oh, plays. Man. The Undertaker comes out. Oh, it's fun, right? It was, and I'm sitting was. there going, this is so fun. Can you imagine if there's physicality? By the and way, the how great did Taker look? Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. It's funny. I, we were watching, uh, by this point, we were actually in bed, uh, Mella and I, watching, watching the last couple segments. And Taker came out, and she was like, my God, like, he's still so cool. And, and yes. he is. And even at his, and I hate, to, I'm trying to massage this, at, at an older age, later in life, as a hey, retired age, buddy. superstar. Mm -hmm. Taker still has that same credibility. He's almost like evolving into Clint Eastwood. Yes. Like as Clint That's Eastwood exactly the name. got older, he was still Dirty Harry. He was a little, he had a couple yeah. more lines in his face. He was maybe a little slower than he used to be. But no matter what, if Clint Eastwood makes a movie this week, you're going, oh, that's freaking Clint Eastwood. He's dirty. Yeah. He's always dirty hair. He's always a cowboy. He's always that badass. And there are various iterations of Undertaker that he can play with and, and reach into the closet and grab whenever he so desires. There's no reason Undertaker can't do this run because he's <laughs> such a pop culture phenomenon for another 10 years. Obviously, sporadically, yes. but once in a blue moon, in case of emergency break glass, which Undertaker has been all too proud to be through the duration of his WWE tenure, to come out still in physical condition, not looking like he couldn't do what he did to Braun Breaker. This wasn't a case of, oh, it's a nostalgia thing. Oh, it was a feel good. Oh, he kind of hit that move. It didn't look as great, but we'll be happy because it was The Undertaker. No, he damn near put Braun Breaker into the lights <laughs> when he delivered the choke slam. And it was so cool that that I was I was jealous. I was envious of everybody in the performance center mm -hmm. uh, or the the Capital Wrestling Center that uh, that night to be that close in that environment to some of the biggest stars in the history of our business. Sam, you've nailed it. When you said so much Christmas in one night, like I'm picturing like this kid and, and, and the biggest present of all is behind the tree, but it's at the very end. You nearly forget about it. And it's like, oh, it's the Undertaker. Like the the the, the fact that. NXT, think about the, the, the generations involved in that show, whether it's, you know, Paul Heyman being there, whether it's The Undertaker, John Cena, two of the greatest of all time, The, the Undertaker chatting with Rick's son, you know, the Steiner brothers and everything involved in the history of this game to the most electrifying and hottest superstars today in Cody Rhodes and LA Knight. And then two of the best young superstars coming through in Rhea Ripley and Solo Sokoa. It was just absolutely stacked. And for me, guys, you know, I think it's fair a question. Like, who stood out from an NXT standpoint throughout the show? Trick Williams, for mm. me, in those in those valuable few minutes. I thought his backstage with Cena, he was as natural as could be. The moment where he gives Rhea Ripley the smile and he has Ripley in his arms, as natural as can be. I, I think for me, Corey, he's an absolute stud. Oh, you'll get no disagreement. I, I've waxed poetic about Trick for, for a couple of weeks now, especially since No Mercy, which to me was like really his coming out party. We knew we had something there, but then to see it in full effect in an arena that was not th the standard, that was not the NXT home base, so to speak, and to see the reaction Trick got, I completely agree with you. I think Trick has a higher upside than a lot of people. Uh, but that said, the, the real work begins now if you're NXT, right? If you're... Carmelo Hayes, if you're Braun Breaker, if you're Ilya Dragunov, yes, this week was a blessing. Yes, this was fun. You got to rub elbows with some of the greatest of all time, but back to the original point that it happened. That was WWE making as big a bang as we could on Tuesday night saying, hey, everybody, come join the party. Come check this out. Yes, you came for The Undertaker, but hopefully you stay for Ilya Dragunov. Yes, you came for, for John Cena, 
But now maybe you're a Trick Williams guy. That's the goal. But now that was a one week. It was a one off. It was a special occasion. Now, granted, you're still going to have Becky Lynch as the NXT Women's Champion on the roster regularly. But everybody to a person up and down that roster needs to wake up Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, and think to myself, okay, how do we, who are still here, compete with what we just did? And, and that's, a, that's a healthy type of competition. That's an ethos that everyone should adopt. I know Seth Rollins lives by that to this very day. He said on, on this show, Rollins yearns for change and constant evolution, and, they, and he wants everybody to step up from the bottom of the card to the tip top. Never rest on your laurels. Never get complacent. But you were handed a gift by the WWE universe. You know, obviously the office helped to coordinate all that stuff. But the, okay, we're all watching. Now what are you going to do with it? And to me, if NXT, the people in charge from Shawn Michaels on down, realize what they had on Tuesday night and have that mindset. And I'd be willing to bet they do. But you have to do the work now. You, you've been given the keys to the car. Now, where are you going? You better keep moving. You better keep moving forward. You better keep advancing. You better all keep stepping up to become bigger stars. Yeah, Trick Williams is a star. We're, we're chatting about him right here. But Trick Williams isn't a world heavyweight champion yet. Yeah, Roxanne Perez pushed Asuka to the limit. They had a hell of a match. Roxanne Perez isn't an NXT women's champion yet. She hasn't headlined a pay-per-view or a pay premium live event yet but these people all need to use what happened tuesday as a driving force saying like we know what this feels like hey guess what guys as special as nxt was on tuesday night with that cast of characters we have that every monday night we have that every friday night on smackdown that was almost like hey here's a taste kids Keep doing what you're doing, and you'll get to come to the big playground and do it on a regular basis while simultaneously raising the profile of NXT. And again, we talked about that, the business. I'm not letting any trade secrets out. There are TV rights deals. It's big news. Everybody in the company, from Nick Khan to Triple H, mentioned it. If you pick up any sports publication right now, any media publication, they're talking about the WWE rights deals. There's a lot of money on the table right now, and everybody in NXT should be going, let me get my piece. Let's all let's get our piece of the pie as a brand, as individual talents. When whenever Raw ends up wherever it ends up, or if it stays on USA, whatever the, the world looks like once all these things shake out, don't forget about us. We're NXT, and whether we're on Mondays or Fridays, or guess what, Tuesday nights, or hell, who knows? Maybe we do Sunday nights. Who knows what the future holds? NXT can stand on their own two feet and say, hey, yeah, we are a viable, legitimate third brand. We're no longer just the feeder system. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. And I also think that this, it couldn't be happening at a better time. If if this had happened to NXT a year, two years ago, maybe, and they were in this position where it's like, now it's time to deliver on the highest level, it would have been tough. You know, NXT was in the phase that NXT was in. But right now, I've never seen, I mean, NXT is as hungry now as I had ever seen them, at, even at the height of black and gold. This is the crew backstage from Shawn Michaels and all the way down wanting to show everybody the wrestling show that they're capable of putting on. And everybody from from Mello to Trick to Tiffany Stratton to everybody that you saw, that's why shows like No Mercy are right. so freaking good. Because I, I think that the NXT people are hungry to to have a motivation like they got on Tuesday. And I personally think they're going to be able to deliver on all of it. Sam, I, I completely agree with your assessment. And I would almost say that no mercy was the cake. Tuesday night was the icing. Okay, right. look at what it can be. It, okay, so you, you lose a layer of icing, you lose John Cena. Well, guess what? Watch no mercy because from top to bottom, stacked. Fellas, do you think this is why the top superstars want to go down to NXT right now? Because the talent is developing at the rate that they are. Yes, and, and I think, and you could see it on everyone's faces. John Cena even verbalized it. The atmosphere in there was special. It's different. You could see every main roster talent up and down the list who appeared last night. It was, it was rejuvenating. It can remind you 
why we do this, why we grind, why we deal with the frustrations, why we argue and sit in the car and talk about how everything should be, why we have podcasts to complain and pontificate about because we care. We love it. It is, it is the blood that runs through our veins. And even for a John Cena, the greatest of all time, the Undertaker, 1A on the list of greatest of all time, will show up willingly, take time out of their schedules to go be part and experience NXT because it's a reminder. It's a love letter. No matter what level you're at, this is still fun. We still care. We still love this. And man, we cannot wait to see what comes next. Well, fortunately, KP, we won't have to wait long because the season premiere of Friday Night SmackDown is tonight if you're listening as this drops, as you always should each and every week. The Tribal Chief returns. Triple H has promised a huge announcement. I don't dare even speculate these days because all it does is get me in trouble on Twitter. Brawling Brutes will square off against a returning yes boy pretty deadly <laughs> can't wait for that oh and if friday night smackdown is not enough for you raw season premiere right around the corner intercontinental title on the line big bronson reed challenging the ring general gunther and so much more i cannot wait it is a good time to be a member of the wwe universe it certainly is gravy one year on the commentary desk with you thank you Genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. People at home have no idea. I always call you an armadillo, crunchy on the outside, soft on the inside. But you are. You, you, you genuinely have helped me beyond words. And uh, it's the most daunting role I've ever been in in my life. And yet every single step of the way, you've, you've, you've helped me so much. So thank you, buddy. Oh, Great thank you for killing it. my gimmick on my own podcast. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Sammy, before we let you go, man, where can the ATB faithful find you? Because God knows you're a busy man. Yes, well, if you like listening to After the Bell, hopefully you'll also like my podcast. It's called Not Sam Wrestling. You can get it on Apple or Spotify, or if you like to watch, uh, the whole podcast goes up every week on the Not Sam Wrestling YouTube channel, along with bonus shows and uh, interviews that I do all the time. And I even did a live watch along on, on Tuesday night for NXT, so you never know what I'm going to be doing over there. But just look up Not Sam Wrestling wherever you consume podcasts or uh, other content. You'll find me. At Not Sam, all over your socials, including YouTube. Make sure you're following us at After the Bell WWE on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find me at WWE Graves and complain to me about thinly veiled references that you just didn't get. Uh, you can find KP at Kev underscore Egan. Listen for free where you get your podcast. Just search After the Bell and hit that follow button so you never miss an episode. Full episodes available on WWE's official YouTube channel each and every Monday, so make sure you don't miss that, and we'll be back next week with more wisdom, more vitriol, and more WWE after the bell. Like what you hear? Catch full episodes of After the Bell wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us now and never miss an episode.